We are very happy to have you all here today. As we've mentioned before, very thankful to God that we have this opportunity. I'm thankful to God for another beautiful Lord's Day. Um, a few weeks ago, we had begun a, uh, a small series of lessons on Christians in a cancer, cancer, it is a cancer, and a cancel culture. That's a tongue twister there, Gary. It is a spiritual cancer that we're dealing with. I guess I could tie that in, right? And uh, admittedly, uh, this was based on a, an article written by Brother Joe Price that's in uh, the um, Truth Magazine. I think it, I don't know if it's this month or last month. And it was also the one that Nelson had broken down into four segments and put into the communicator, which ended just a few weeks ago. Um, the uh, bulk of the points were mainly his, but I tried to make it my own. I felt that it was, uh, it's too important not to discuss these things and to discuss the, the threat that is facing not only our culture, our society, our time, but the church. And so uh, I want to look at some of this. I was going to break it likewise down into uh, a few segments here. In the last time, we just looked at an introduction to the idea that we're dealing with and uh, dealing with uh, the Christians dealing with uh, living in a cancel culture. And then this morning, we want to talk about uh, more specifically the war on children, gender roles, and marriage. And that's where we want to spend our time focusing this morning. Now, uh, as we begin to look at the idea of canceling children, the war on children, uh, one of the points that was made by Brother Price was kill the children. That was one of the paragraphs that he dealt with. And uh, of course, when he dealt with that, he's talking about abortion to a large degree. But he pointed out that previous cultures killed children to eliminate threats. There's reasons why that happened. It might be very different or somewhat different than what we experience in our culture and time, but the results are the same is that babies are dying. And but if you go back to what was mentioned uh, in Exodus chapter 1 and verses 15 through 22, Pharaoh ordered the death of the male Hebrew babies. The uh, Israelites were becoming a, a mighty mighty group of people in Egypt at the time and and uh, in order to uh, out of fear that they might rise up against uh, the the Egyptians, they decided to enslave them. One of the things that they decided to do was to eliminate the male children. After all, these are the fighting persons of, of any group of people, the men, right? And so in Exodus chapter 1 and verses 15 through 22, we see that uh, uh, there was that the, the death of the, all the males, and of course Moses was spared. We know the story very well. Uh, I'm going to uh, have you read with me in Exodus chapter 1. We'll just go back. It's not a very long read. We'll just read how that played out. Exodus chapter 1, beginning of verse 15 through the end of the chapter, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives and on, uh, of whom the name of the one was Sifra and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives fear God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. So it goes from instructing the midwives to everybody. If you see a male baby born, then you must slaughter him. And we notice that uh, this, this kind of repeats itself by the time you get to Matthew chapter 2. There's another example in verses 16 through 19, in which King Herod, who uh, you can see was also in fear of a threat of one who was born. When the Magi, the wise men, had come to, uh, to Bethlehem, or to the uh, to, in search of of Jesus, the uh, the one that had been born. By the time they got to him, evidently he was a little toddler. He wasn't just a newborn babe. Those nativity scenes are actually false according to scripture. He wasn't still in a manger. If he's in a manger for two years, we got a bigger problem here. And so, uh, when they come and inquire of him, Herod hears about this, and he wants to know who is this, and where is he supposed to show up, and 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 even the the uh, 
the Jewish leaders of their day, the religious leaders knew they could have said according to prophecy, you know, for thus it is written by the prophet and then mentions Bethlehem, totally quotes the passage. They knew that the Messiah was to come from, from this, uh, this uh, to, in Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, through Bethlehem. And so the uh, King Herod instructs the wise men, when you find him, tell me about him. Tell me where I can find him so that I too may worship him, which was a complete hoax. His desire was to eliminate him. And of course, being warned by God, they separated and he left a different way. Herod was very uh, enraged. In verse 16, it says, Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by, the, by uh, Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they were no more. And uh, uh, really, verse 18 is where we'd end the reading there. But you can see, again, there was, an, there was this effort to, to, to snuff out a whole generation of children. There was a, an effort to destroy uh, these these new lives, newborn lives, and uh, for the for very evil purposes. But even now, as we consider our day and time, I don't know that there's too many people in America that has has gone through this experience because they felt that, that the baby was a threat to their well being or a threat to their their status in life or whatever. But whatever the case may be, even now millions of unborn children are destroyed through abortion to relieve at the very least, short-sighted, selfish, and sinful desires. That's what, uh, that's what we need to understand. I, uh, I remember uh, last year, at the end of last year, we had talked about some numbers. Now, this would be uh, uh, inflated from the time I gave it, much uh, uh, even more so than the time frame that we, uh, we had. According to uh, the information we've been able to find just in research, that since the time of Roe versus Wade, Roe v. Wade, January 22nd, 1973, that ruling that uh, there had been at least up and through uh, January 10th of 2020, uh, over 61, 61.6 million abortions in the United States. That would certainly not include all of the time from then till now, which is another year and a half. And so I believe we estimated that roughly uh, there are 1.3 abortions per year. So just go ahead and do the math and see how many children that would be. That would probably far exceed all the death of the children in Egypt uh, to Pharaoh's command or Herod's command in terms of those children who lived in and around Bethlehem. There's always been this idea that, that it's okay to take the life of children. In every culture, it seems that that, that, is the, that is the problem that we're facing. And cancel culture attacks truth and decency on these things. It doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen, that it's okay to do that, to take a, a child's life, a human being's life, even before they're born, they are a human being. Life is in the blood, and heartbeat begins, what, around day 18 or 24 or whatever, and uh, it is, it's actually, it, it, the evidence is there that, that, that it is a life, but it's okay to do that, but don't you dare, don't you dare, you know, crush an eagle's egg or you know, if you do some harm to some animal, you might spend some serious time in jail. That seems really backwards to me. Does that seem backwards to you? If you speak against that sort of thing, if you speak against, against abortion, if you speak against taking the lives of children, you are going to be canceled. Politicians enforce and support the, the cancellation of children's lives. And so the cancer culture attacks truth and decency on these things, and they do so under the guise of protecting children. After all, we, we love our children. Are they going to do it to protect them? Children's physical and spiritual development is being killed to advance a secular agenda in public schools. If we were to research that and bring that to the table, we could spend all afternoon talking about the curriculum that would end up that uh, in, in the eyes and ears of your children and grandchildren. That would be, to some degree, not altogether, but to some degree, very ungodly. That to speak out against that, you will be canceled. You are the one who will be targeted as the troublemaker. I remember one time in the Bible when Elijah came to speak to the king and the first words out of the king's mouth was uh, basically, what do you want, O troubler of Israel? 
That's what he called Elijah. But who was the troubler of Israel? It was the man who was causing Israel to sin. And that was the king. That was not the prophet Elijah. Everything's backwards. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Things like that. As the prophet Isaiah warned about. But that's where we are right now. We're putting bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Calling evil good and good evil. That's the society that we are in. In the United States of America. Right here in May. What is today's day? 16th? 2021? You say the year of our Lord, but see, the, the Lord gets canceled, says. We don't want to talk about God very much in society. But it is still the year of our Lord, isn't it? As all of life, everything that exists is because of his almighty power. And so on the subject of some other things we want to, to look at with this, it's important for us to understand that while we are while we are trying very hard to uphold the truth we've got one too many going there a little fast on the draw trigger happy I'm quoting brother Price directly from his uh, article uh, he says disguised as anti-bias anti-bullying instruction curricula indoctrinate children with an inclusion quote unquote inclusion ethos supporting the LGBTQ community and that's that's just one thing he mentions that but he he singles the one thing out but there's a lot of things that that are being added to the curricula or the curriculum of of, uh, of teaching in schools, but this is one of the big things that that is being promoted. What they what they are trying to teach our children and our grandchildren at the earliest of ages is to be all inclusive to the things that God says we are to be separate from. And if you say anything about that, show any concern about that at all, then you are a bigot, and that you're bullying them. And things like that. So you're not allowed to have a voice. Freedom of speech in this country has become free speech to those who, who are in position of power. But not everybody really has freedom of speech. Because if freedom of speech was equally ex, you know, expressed across the board. And we would be able to say the things we want to say from the scriptures. Without any persecution. But that is simply not the case. So what we have to do is to be able to... to to, from the scriptures to take the truth into this, these crowds of people, into these homes, and try to counter what is being taught. Because at the very tender ages, there are a lot of things that's being indoctrinated into our children, and the school system has your children more during the week than you do. The school system sees your children several more hours per week than the parents do. That's a lot of time. To be indoctrinated at times, at points, not in every class, maybe not every test, maybe not every topic, but at the very least here and there, that's a lot of time and exposure to your children and grandchildren. And then you have to counter that when they're home. And for how long do you have them of an evening? And, and, and how, how, how strong are they in terms of their faith if you have helped them come to faith? They, they are, there is a fight for their souls that is happening Outside of the purview of your of your attention to them. And so it is no wonder that children begin to grow up and, and they, what, one generation understood that from the scriptures certain things were were patently wrong. It didn't make a difference who they were. It was nothing personal against the person because the Christian as God hates the sin, but does not hate the sinner. There is a difference between the two. God hates sin, but he loves the sinner so much he sent his son to die for them that if they would come out of their sins and come to him through his son by obedience to his son, that they would be saved. That's how much God loves the sinner. And we too, we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. We don't want anyone to perish. No one. Christ died even for them. And so it's very important that we recognize the dangers that are there and swat away the accusations of bigotry and, and prejudice and, and, and bullying or whatever. Because that's simply not the case. If you disagree with some people, that, that you're just, you know, that's when the names come. If you have a disagreement at all, if you, if you don't see it on their terms, then you're the one that's got the problem. If to them, one plus one equals three, and you're like, no, I can show you right here's a calculator. One plus one, look, at the equal button that says two. No, <laughs> no, 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 you're a bigot. 
Well, that's what this is. One plus one equals two here. This is the calculator that we use. It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's not the opinion of any politician. It's not even the opinion of the courts of the land. Truth is truth. And there is nothing but the truth. That's what supposedly, if you swear on the stand, that's what you do. I swear, swear these things are true, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Then let's speak about nothing but the truth. Because in this cancer, cancel culture society, cancer culture society, this is the problem we're facing. The truth does not have a voice. You're the only voice it has. And again, I am reminded of the hymn that's in the hymn books. I love this. Probably the most profound hymn that you're, that you're ever going to read and, and sing. is That's the world's Bible. Remember that? Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet and to lead men in his way. He talks about, in the, in the lyrics of that, look it up if you will. It's, uh, I don't remember the number. Somebody know the number offhand? 460. Brother Doug Bennett's very fond of that song as well. Number 460. You read the lyrics to that hymn, and that, that's exactly who we are. We may be the only voice at the, at the parent-teacher conference that has the truth. We may be the only voice that our little communities are going to hear the truth from. This is not the time to let somebody else do the work. It's the time to let our light shine and to proclaim the truth of God's word in a loving fashion. Speak the truth in love. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, he says, speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. And that's why regardless of any accusations that are thrown at you, and that is an attempt to silence you, by the way, because if you point out the obvious truth to them and they start calling you a bigot, people get scared. Well, I don't, be a, well, I don't want to be associated with that. I got a good standing in this community. I got a good standing in this school. I got a good standing wherever. And they do that as a tactic to shut you up. Speak louder. Say more. Speak until you can't. Because God's word will be, not, it will not be denied. It will accomplish what he pleases and it will prosper in the thing for which he sent it, whether it's through your mouth or through someone else's. But it is our obligation, yours and mine, that we speak the truth and never be afraid of the opposition because truth has nothing to fear, ladies and gentlemen. Truth has nothing to fear. And as Brother Price points out, since God is impartial and biased and bullies, no one Christian stand against the reform of such bias. And I, I think it's, I almost didn't put this on here because I thought it was a foregone conclusion, but I thought, now maybe I should. Because as I was contemplating that, I remember when I was uh, probably in my, uh, around 10 or 12, preteen range, and we had a gospel meeting in town in a little village of Peyton City, West Virginia. You know, the one stop light town is still only one stop light. <laughs> And we decided we was going to go around and we're going to put meeting flyers in all the doors and we're going to invite the whole village, the whole, the whole town, Hayden City, to this gospel meeting. Now that was a good effort. We had a lot of young, uh, young uh, uh, fellows from, from uh, between the ages of eight and probably early, mid-teens that were doing that throughout on a, on a given Saturday, I think it was. But there was, there was at least one that when they would go to the door and they would knock on the door and invite them and they'd try to, try to convert them right there. You know, it was almost this, uh, you know, if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, then you're going to hell or some kind of attitude like that. Then the doors would get shut in their face. You're not going to get anywhere by talking like that. All you're trying to do is invite people to come hear the truth. And the truth is what's going to end up being their hearts. That kind of dialogue, which could end up being, being true in terms of the body of Christ as we read it in the New Testament. If, if you're not a member of the body of Christ in the New Testament and the church is his body, the body is his church in that respect. Yes, if you're not in that body, you will be condemned to an eternal hell. But the way that comes off is if you don't come to my particular church, you're going to hell. Nobody's going to buy into that and subscribe to that. It was a very, very poor choice of words and a very poor way to do it. It wasn't going to save anyone. If anything, it created animosity toward that little group in Peyton City, West Virginia. And that was just a child doing that. That could easily come across as being bullish. Well, see, we don't do that. We speak the truth and we speak the truth in love. That's the most important thing that we need to focus on because God wants everyone to be saved. When Peter opened his mouth at the house of Cornelius, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality in every nation. Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. What is he saying there? But it doesn't make a difference really what your background is. 
If you're willing to hear the truth and obey the truth, regardless of whether you had formerly killed a child, regardless if you were formerly a, a homosexual, regardless of whether you had robbed a bank, regardless of whatever your past was, that if you're willing to obey the will of God from the heart, he will accept you no matter where you're from, who you are. But you must change. That's just the truth. Because God doesn't show partiality. He, he, he wants everyone to be saved. He sent his son to die for everyone. You, me, everyone. All of those murderers we're talking about. All of the evil in the world. Those who are evildoers. Christ died even to save them. If they would just turn and obey that they may be saved. How many other passages of scripture that would emphasize that? God so loved the world. This is one of the most quoted passages of scripture in history probably. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't make a difference who you are or were. What makes a difference right now is are you willing to be saved? Are you willing to get into the lifeboat of salvation? Or do you want to just drown in the depths of the sea of sin? And death? It is God's will to save all. And as we take that mindset into the world, we realize when we're knocking on the door, or we're talking to somebody, regardless of how they might react to us, we have to keep the poise of Christ in a situation like that and realize that he died even for them. We're not trying to make enemies. We're trying to, to turn souls to Christ. And that was never an easy task to do. I mean, sometimes perhaps it was. Sometimes the gospel was preached, you read about, and people would receive it gladly. But a lot of times it came with great opposition and a lot of hardship. And Paul talked about that in his own personal life in 2 Corinthians 11. He had endured such great hardships taking the truth, the saving, soul-saving truth into the world around him. But it was worth it even if only to save one. And so what do we do when we approach people? We need to have the right attitude. Maybe this is the one we should always remember, the golden rule. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. We water that down a little bit. We reword it a little bit. Do unto others as they do unto you. Probably not the best way to say it, you know. Because we, uh, it's more like doing others what you'd rather they did unto you. That's kind of the idea. This is, this is the idea. So we want to approach people the way we would want to be approached. We approach them with grace and love because that's what we would want people to embrace us with. Paul says in Romans 13, verses 8 and 10, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then verse 10, love does, not, does no harm to a neighbor. Now that you can take that very literally. You can go to your neighbor's house and love does no harm to them. If you really are coming in the name of love, that is, that is the driving force of what you're saying and what you're doing. It's not doing anyone any harm. They might not like what they hear. It might be that they are hurt because the truth hurts sometimes. The truth, the word of God describes in Ephesians 6 as the sword of God. Well, a sword has a real sharp tip to it. And I'll be honest with you, I have been at the receiving end of that sharp tip too many times to count in my life. Ouch, truth does hurt a lot. Of, it, it's going to most of the time. But there is nothing else. That's the only thing that will save you. It seems like that's going to kill you, doesn't it? Well, it will if you keep resisting against it. It will pierce you through. The truth is the thing that should hurt. But even with all of that, with all of that, don't let that, don't let anyone tell you, well, no, you should treat us like that, therefore you shouldn't tell us what we need to hear. Or, you know, And if you tell us what we need to hear, then you're a bigot and you're... You're a bully or whatever. No. Because the fact is, is, while these things are true and that's the attitude and spirit we should have, we will not deny the truth on the altar of conformity. We're not going to go along just to get along. Why are there churches around this nation today, and yea, probably around the world, why are there churches that exist around this, in this nation today that just a few generations ago would have never dreamt of accepting homosexuality into the fellowship of that church? Denominations, whoever. They didn't, and now they did. Why is that? It wasn't that, they, that the, the scales fell from their eyes and they saw some truth that wasn't there before? Is there something in the scripture? Is there something in Third Peter? Well, there's no Third Peter, the first and second. You know where they find these things? Misapplications, chapter 1, verse 5. Opinions, chapter 6, and verse 13. That's where they find these things. It's not in scripture. Why did they change their minds? Was it fear? Were they afraid to get canceled? 
Were they afraid that their doors would be shut down? Were they afraid somebody was going to persecute that, don, that church in that location? Is that what it was? Did they have family members in the church there that had succumbed to that? Because, because the morality of our families has eroded a little bit by little bit by a lot by a lot over all these generations to the degree that if we say that's wrong and that's a sin, they're just going to stop coming to church. We can't have that. So we're going to start accepting it now. If you're going to accept homosexuality, you want to accept everything else. I wonder if they'd let Hitler in too, as Hitler. Not a reformed, converted Hitler. Evil is always evil and righteousness is always righteousness, period, the end. Why did they change? They conformed, why? Never compromise the truth. The truth will not be. God does not accept that. And they will stand in judgment because of that. So while we will never go out of our way, we dare not ever go out of our way to come across as as a bully or whatever. We are not bigoted simply because we are upholding the simple truth of God's will and we speak it in love. Because on the other hand, God is God is actually delighted when we expose sin for what it is. He is pleased with exposing the darkness of, of evil, even the transgender agenda or homosexual agenda or all the other evils that we have often talked about. Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 8 through 11. For you who were once, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. When you see what he's saying here, you are not to be like the world. Doesn't he say the same thing in Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2? In verse 2, he mentions that. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed. Be transformed. How? Well, you need to know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's where the transformation comes in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed from the world to God. That's what God wants. That's why Christ died. Remember this. Jesus didn't die so that you can... Continue to live in sin and grace may abound. Didn't know what Paul said in Romans chapter 6 verse 1? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? The point is, is grace cannot save you if you stay and linger in sin. So contrary to the teaching of many in the religious world around us, God does not accept that. He does not accept this. Christians we do that, we are, to, we are to say these things without any sense of bullying to it. We're to speak the truth in love. Be very kind and gentle. Let your speech always be with grace, and with salt, so that you know how to answer each one. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. But can we say the same would be, would be extended to us in cancel culture? Is that how they come to you? When, when they see that you disagree with their evil agenda... Do they generally, some of them probably do, they probably are very kind because they might be your friend and they're trying to respond in kind, but how many times is it that suddenly you're under attack? If you notice, and you've noticed it in social media, you've noticed it on the news, you notice around you that they use bullying tactics themselves while signaling their virtue and canceling you out, saying that you're the bully. It's kind of a, a mind twister. It reminds me a little bit of what Paul says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, and for whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. That's the first verse that comes to my mind by those in our culture that accuse us of bullying, accuse you of bullying, even though you might have been just as sweet and as kind as you can be about it and have just let the Bible do the talking, but they have been as vile as they can be toward you and have the audacity to say that you're the bully. Romans 2 and verse 1, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of these issues, I think, probably, as we're going to turn our attention to redefining gender, gender in marriage. A lot of these issues, I think, in our nation has started with, uh, and this, isn't, this, this isn't all of it, but this comes to my mind, is the, the idea of the feminist movement in this country. Now, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, hey, why don't I make the same amount of money as a man or whatever? might be so, some legitimate questions to ask. But to a large degree, what I've noticed over the history of feminism in this country is it wasn't just equal pay. It wasn't really about that. It was really, 
It, it ultimately got to this point where men, the women wanted to be the men. They want to have the power of the men. They want to have everything that the man has, which I find kind of a, kind of a, a joke, really. And the reason I say that is they just want the good bits. They want all the positive things. They don't want the negative things that seem to come with it. I remember a guy writing about this, and I thought it was kind of funny the way he put it. He was a little bit rough around the edges about it, but he's like, you know, you know, in his world, you know, they, they would like, they, they shave the hair down real, real close like a man's hair and things like that. He said, but the moment of trouble would come, they twist those little hairs into little braids and I'm just a girl, you know, and, and so they want the man to deal with it. If there's a house fire, the man's got to deal with it. If there's a bump in the night, she sends the man down. She wants to be equal with the man, but when, when there's a bump in the night, he goes down. Yes, he's got a knife, you know. He's the one that has to go down and face that, right? We made this kind of joke about it, but there's some truth to that. Feminism, basically what that was, they want, all, they want to cherry pick through and have all the good stuff, but they don't want any of the stuff, the other stuff that comes with being a man. And that was kind of the, just I think one of the foundational reasons why we are where we're at now with the, the transgender ideas, that we're trying to blur, they're trying to blur the line, the distinction so that there are no men and women, there's just human beings, there's just like one gender. That's a problem. And the problem comes right from the top. Here's a quote from Joe Biden. And y'all of you, a lot of you probably know this because this is a few months old now. The idea that an eight-year-old child or a 10-year-old child decides, you know, I decided I want to be transgender. That's what I think I'd like to be. It would be, it'd make my life a lot easier. There should be zero discrimination. He says some other things too, but that's the quote I'm going to share with you in the interest of time. How old did he say, by the way? It's bad enough to talk about that, you know, people ought to be able to choose their gender, which is playing God. God made you the way you are. If you're a man today, that's the way evidently God wanted you to be. And if you're a woman today, that was the gender God has chosen for you. And to try to change that is one and the same as saying, God, I don't agree with the way you made me, so I'm going to play God and do it my way. There's no escape from that conclusion. Is that not what that's saying? And so, not only, you might see adults doing that, but now he's, he's saying, and actually you could say encouraging, that children at the tender ages of 8 and 10 could make that choice, and parents ought to go along with that as well as the rest of us. How, just exactly where did we go off the rails of getting away from God to this degree? That's what I'd like to know. Let me, uh, let's go with uh, some thoughts here from Scripture. I don't want to keep you much longer, but gender roles as God created them. There's tons of scriptures I could use, so I'm only going to use a few of these because I realize that there would be a good bit of time in this lesson if I, if I, uh, by the time I get to this point, much less if I read all of them. And here are some I want to share with you. Genesis 1 and 27, the creation week. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You're going to notice that when God created the world and not a human being it was in existence, he created Adam from the dust of the ground. The chapter goes on to suggest, even in chapter 2, read Genesis 1 and 2 together. God created Adam from the dust of the ground, and he created Eve from a rib from his side. And one was a male, one was a female. There were two genders. God didn't make one gender. He made two genders because that is the way he wanted it to be. And I should add two, not to get ahead of my notes here, but... Uh, Procreation is impossible unless you have a male and a female. That's true in the, uh, for the most part, in the animal kingdom. That is certainly true in the in the, the su subject of humanity. You cannot you cannot procreate unless you have a male and a female. You have to have uh, the seed and you have to have the egg. One generates one. One generates the other. So common sense should tell you that there are gender roles and that they serve a function that's important for the survival of the human race. And so you have this idea that God created male and female. In Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5, in terms of being a man and a woman, God expects a man to act like a man and a woman to act like a woman. God says, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. We're not talking about some comedy skit of Klinger on MASH trying to get on a Section 8 because he thinks he's a woman when he's a man. Everybody laughs about that. But the fact is, there are people who do that. And they've been doing it for a really, really, really long time. We're not talking about somebody who gets on the stage and is just playing a part because there wasn't enough 
You know, I, I've heard of schools where there's like three girls and there's like five girl parts and some so guy puts on this wig and this dress and tries to change his voice to get through the play or whatever. We're talking about a, a, an, a, an obvious attempt for a man to be a woman and a woman to be a man. This isn't play acting. This is real. God says it's an abomination because those roles have a distinction to God. Man has his place and a woman has her place in the created process and in the process, not only procreation, but in the family unit. And you're going to notice that even in the New Testament, there is a distinction between what a man can do and what a woman can do, according to Almighty God. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but be in silence. This is a passage of scripture, by the way, that, that uh, infuriates, I guess is the word. I guess we forgot to turn off the baptistry. This is a passage of scripture that infuriates feminists. How dare you tell me that I cannot have the same authority as a man? God says, for Adam was formed first in Eve. The reason of the hierarchy of power, if you will, the hierarchy of that situation is because Adam was formed first and then was Eve. And God is a he, by the way. And how many in the Feminist and transgender world have written Bible. There's a Bible out there right now. I can't remember the name of it. In which God is a she. Just to level the playing field. That's an abomination. Talk about blasphemy. And so you will see in Old and New Testament alike. You have this idea that God wants men to act like men. And that they have their place. And women are to act like females. And they're to know their place. And each of them have a role to play it singularly in the society around them and in the marital unit, in the family unit, and so on and so forth. In fact, when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 and 10, there's a small laundry list of things that will cost a person their soul in eternal hell if they were to continue to do them until the day they die and do not convert to Christ coming out of these sins. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, drunkards, dr covetous nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. In the King James Version, one of those words is effeminate. I don't have time to get into the hair splitting festival that that could generate. I do know of some people... In my personal life, I've known of them where the guy acts a little bit less. He's not, let's just say he's not an alpha male, but he's married and has kids and seems to be completely, you know, heterosexual. Maybe there's some biological makeup that makes, makes a guy seem a little less manly in American, by American standards, by John Wayne standards, and that they're, that they're, that they're not homosexual. The idea of effeminacy isn't just the way that they come across, it's the way they live their life. It's the conduct of their life. The woman wearing the man's clothing and the man wearing the woman's clothing and trying to take on the gender role, that is, that is frowned upon by God. Many who support transgenderism and those who call for no gender distinction at all will even go so far if they bother to open a Bible at all, they always try to find some scripture to throw, you know, turn, turn the tables on you as the one who is the truth bearer. And they'll use a passage like Galatians 3, verses, uh, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Right there says there's no distinction between genders. Oh, Christian. And they do that. That's what happens when you cherry pick your way through the Bible and you misapply the context because they twist the, script, the scriptures to their own destruction as well they do the rest of the scriptures. As Peter would put it in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17, 16. But what, what is the context of that? For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He is describing, he's describing being a member of the body of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, being in the family of God. And in terms of that, there is no Jew and Greek situation. You are one. No matter who you are, if you're Jewish or you're anybody else, if you obey the gospel, you belong to Christ. If you are a slave in this life or you're free, whether you're not a slave or your master one, but in Jesus Christ, you both belong to Jesus Christ. 
In terms of male and female, there are male roles and female roles. There's obligations for both. The idea of salvation is extended that it's not that only males will be saved or only females. You're all one in Christ, no matter what your status is, social or family or whatever. You are all one in Christ Jesus. It's a simple point that gets abused by these people because they're trying to force a square peg in a round hole and say, aha. All it is saying is that no matter who you are, men, women, children, black, white, purple, blue, no matter what continent you live on or what dispensation of time that you live in, if you obey God through Jesus Christ, every single one of you belong to Christ and there is no distinction. That is all that means. Marriage as God designed it. The cancel culture calls us biased and bigoted when we object to redefining marriage to include same-sex relationships and redefining families to include gender, uh, same-gender parents. Now, I've only got a, just a few passages left for you here. I knew this, this wasn't going to be a 30-minute sermon, and I hope you know that's not going to be either. It's hard to say important things to this depth in just 30 minutes. At least it's hard for this preacher to do it. So hang in there. Keep your eyeballs open. Keep your ears open. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, we alluded to that a moment ago. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Even Adam had the common sense to see the difference between men and women. And that the woman at the very beginning was taken out of man, though, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, that ever since that time, all of us come from women, from the womb. But that's not how it started. God chose the rib from Adam's side to make the woman. She came from the man. There's a difference between those two roles. And even most cultures today, as far as I know, I don't know everything, but the, the, the things that I have learned about in various cultures around the world, typically that's what you're going to see. When a husband, a man or woman get married, who takes whose name, by the way? Women, when you got married, did you keep your maiden name or did you take on the man's name? Right there should be a tip off as to the roles of gender. That should be the tip off of the hierarchy of the authority between men and women. Even an atheist can see that. But nonetheless, some people would say, ah, name doesn't mean anything. But it means something to God in which the roles that he has given should be founded upon the biblical principles that he has established. Even Jesus, when he was questioned by the Jewish religious leadership trying to trap him in his words, he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You have the Son of God saying, man and woman, not man and man, not woman and woman. Same-sex marriage is foreign. I'm looking in the camera here, Brother Bennett. Same-sex marriage is foreign to Scripture. It is not a concept that is found in the Bible. It is not anything sanctioned by God. It is a sin. This is what Jesus said. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 and 2, the inspired Apostle Paul. He's inspired of the Holy Spirit. And he says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now he's making a gender distinction. He doesn't say, while it would, it would be evil for a man to touch a man in the way he means, or a woman to touch a woman. But he's talking about the normal, natural process of sexuality in the world. Normal, not odd. The word queer by the way, it comes from oddity. It means odd. And that became an offensive term to those who were homosexual until recent years in which now it's part of the alphabet people, LGBTQ community. They take up like 25% of the alphabet. They're the alphabet people, right? Or there are 26 letters in the alphabet. They took up a bunch of them. But Q is in there. Do you know what that means? I'm like, what does that mean? I'm looking it up and it's queer. And they're like, well, now they're claiming the title. What's going on here? I'm confused. But that's where the term came from, because it's against nature. It is not normal. And so when you look at this, he's talking about what is normal. A man is not good for a man to touch a woman. That's gender specific. Nevertheless, because of sexual morality, let each man have his own wife implying a woman. 
and let each woman have her own husband, gender specific. And then even inside the confines of marriage, Colossians 3 verses 18 and 19, what does God say? Husbands, submit, your, uh, submit to your own husbands. I didn't read that right. Wives, submit to your own wives. I'm still not getting it. What, what am I getting wrong here? Oh, that's not what it says, right? Wife, wives, female, submit to your own husbands, male, as is fitting to the Lord, in the Lord. Husbands, male, love your wives, female, and do not be bitter toward them. He could have said toward her. That's, that's gender specific. There are roles there. And that's the question I have in a same-sex relationship. Who's the husband and who's the wife? And believe me, one of them takes a dominant role and the other one takes a submissive role. Does that make sense at all? If you're going to abandon, if you're going to push against the, the morals of God, wouldn't you just, why not do it across the board? Why is it that there's one's dominant and one's submissive? If it's same sex, it should be same authority. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and 25. Wives, women, females, submit to your husbands, male, as to the Lord husbands, male. Love your wives, female, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for, what's he called the church? Her. Bride of Christ, female, gender specific. Oh, if we had the time to talk about parental things in which you have the roles of fathers and mothers, you know, just throw a couple passages. Ephesians 6 and 4, fathers, train up your children, nurture, nurture and admonition of the Lord, do not provoke them to wrath, that sort of thing. 2 Timothy 1 and 5, this is a compare to passage. When Paul remembered about Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, and the role that they had in bringing him up in the Lord, time would fail us really to talk about so much more we could talk about. But the bottom line is this, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a cancel, cancel culture society, and it's just getting worse. These things have to a large degree already existed in the United States of America for some time, but they have never had the support from from. Uh, from from politics, from political officials to the degree that they have today. And the world of celebrity, which is always back, it seems in recent generations, the most evil things you can come up with, they certainly back it. It seems that the world is against you. All the powers that be seem to support it. They want to talk about the things that are human, but they don't want to talk about the things divine. The only time you ever hear the word God or Christ mentioned in their circles is when they use it as a swear word to curse you or some other thing. God is, is an attempt to cancel God and his people in the society today. So I applaud Brother Price for his article. It needs to be preached. And I hope that you have listened with honest and open hearts. It's important. Don't sweep it under the rug. Don't dismiss it like it's just the rantings of Aaron. God wants to save all, even the people we're talking about. We got to work it out for us. And so if we'll be uh, willing to do that, embrace the will of God, be subject to heaven's call, we hope that you will desire to be a part of that. If you do want to be a child of God, what did we just read? It doesn't make a difference who you are, your background. If you're willing to come, you can be one in Christ Jesus with us, with all who are saved of all generations, if you have a desire to do so. We're going to sing an invitation song, Brother Gary is selected, and we're going to take this time, if you have a desire to do so. Just come forward. There's a front pew that's empty here, and you and I can just sit there and just uh, and discuss what you need very quietly, but we'll address it. We have, You know we have a baptistry because it's humming in the background. We have, we have uh, baptismal clothing so you don't have to get in your street clothes. If, if you so desire to repent, be baptized of your sins, and to walk in newness of life with Christ this hour, we can do that. Uh, any spiritual need you have, please make it known and come forward right now as we stand and as we sing.